everybody. I'm Audrey Moore with Audrey Helps Actors Podcast, and this is episode number 76. Looking to get your fix for the end of the season. Woo! We finished! Woo! Woo! I am so excited about this incredible season that we have had. I have to say, this season has just been so wonderful and the participation from the listeners the excitement the enthusiasm the self-tapes the self-tape may all of it has just been so fantastic i want to start off i know that last week i made a promise to everybody and i intend to keep it that if you did your third year in a row your third year of self-tape may i was going to shout you out so here it is there were a couple people who didn't get added so we're going to do it again Haley O'Connor, Amber Stonebreaker, David Rosenblatt, Amber Wegner, Heather Harper, Leah Magdalene, Natalie Younger, Allie Kincaid, Catherine Taylor Arnold, Manon Pages, Aaron McShane, Kisha Angela Pert, Lynn Downey Braswell, Allison Grishow, Hannah Marie Connolly, Wildcard Williamson, that's Bridget Williamson, Jacqueline Chantel, Chris Brumley, Ian White, and Kathleen Sweet. Oh my God, I am so excited. So that is 20 people, everyone. That's 20 people who have finished their third year in a row doing self-tape May. You guys are rock stars. You are the MVPs to everyone who finished their second year, who has finished a second year in the whole of this time, who has finished their first year, or who has participated at all. Listen, you are better for having done any self-tape practice than for doing none at all. And a little stat that I posted to the social media that I think everyone is really enjoying, just a little FYI. This is the same stat as last year. And again, it's 3% of my followers this year who completed self-tape May. Basically 500 people completed self-tape May. That's out of 16,000 followers. It's about 3.1% of followers who completed the challenge. And the best information is that it is said that only 3% of sag after actors make enough to make a living and 3% of the followers on my Audrey Helps Actors podcast Instagram finished and completed all 16 tapes in self-tape May. So if you are one of them, give yourself a fucking pat on the back because you are awesome. I am so proud of you. If you didn't get them all done, I know that you just did what you could and it's okay and don't beat yourself up. I want to cheerlead you and I want you to know plenty of people last year only got a handful done and completed this year. You know, you just got to get it going. You know, try to get yourself to do four or five tapes of practice with a group every month. You know, just do what you can do. You will make progress, gain momentum. Sometimes you have to start momentum slow. Not everyone works best in extremes. A lot of people work their best in just slowly gaining momentum until they're at 16 tapes. Listen, set a goal to start working up to 16 tapes by this time next year, maybe do two and the next month do three and next month do four until this time next year, you are ready to do 16 self tapes. I can't wait for it. Congratulations to everyone who participated and to everyone who completed and everyone who did their second year and everyone who did their third, you are rock stars. Okay, today we have Jesse James Keitel. This is a really special episode, you guys, because Jesse James was an avid listener to the podcast since like 2017, 2018. Had listened to the podcast, was broken, broke in New York City, graduated with her conservatory degree, and is so passionate and was just starting to get momentum and booked a huge series regular role on The Big Sky and booked another really incredible role. We can't even tell you what it is. And I'm just so proud of her. She is a transgender, gender non-binary actress. And I have watched and listened to many of her interviews through the publicity process of this show. And we get so real about the transition to becoming a series regular, don't you? want to know what that's like? Don't you want to know, like, what is that? How do I prepare for that? What does that look like? 
and guarding your space, guarding your time, guarding your energy, you know, being of service, but not in a way that, you know, destroys your mental health or soul and working during this pandemic, all of the things we really get into it. And it is a beautiful, masterful conversation. I'm so honored that she decided to join me and I'm just so happy for her and all of her continue growing success. This episode is brought to you by weaudition.com. That's weaudition.com, promo code Audrey25. Listen, you've got to be on weaudition.com. I'm on it like a couple times a week, you guys. People help me all the time. And then also Carla Zuniga Hair. If you're looking for a great haircut in Los Angeles, please contact Carla Zuniga at Carla Zuniga Hair on Instagram. All right, I hope you've got a self-tape. Audrey helps actors because they don't know anything. Hi, everybody. I'm Audrey Moore with Audrey Helps Actors, and today we have... Jesse James Keitel. Hello, hello. Hi. You're in Toronto in quarantine, prepared to film. Do you want to, like, give your show that you're currently going to go film, like, a nickname? Sure. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Let's call it the Super Show Show. The Super Show Show. Which is different from the show you've been filming all year, which was The Big Sky Season 1. And you and I are going to sort of talk about all of that. And also, I also like to start telling people, as you know, just sort of about what your landscape looks like. Representation, maybe auditions that you might get, all that sort of stuff. So I am SAG and Equity. I Mm -hmm. currently feel I have a lot of reps. My team really expanded after I booked Big Sky. Mm -hmm. So I have a theatrical agent, a manager, a voiceover agent, a modeling agent, a lawyer, a commercial agent, a publicist who I adore. I adore all of them. I really, I like really love my team. And I feel, I feel really protected and they all, everyone has a different job Mm -hmm. and it just feels so cohesive. It really does. That's awesome. And, yeah. Well, you know, that's a symptom of you. I mean, I always feel like once you get a team, you have to realize like you're the leader of the team. And so like you're the point that pulls it all forward. And the more clarity you have, the better that your team can sort of get on board. I find when an actor has lack of clarity, then everyone else sort of takes over in control. And so I think that's a really good symptom of the clarity that you are leading your career forward with. Thanks. It's That's definitely something I've found over the years. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think I was really frustrated for so long. Like, why? Why aren't I making the progress I, I'm ready to make? Like, I'm ready mm-hmm. to do it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's when I got really a m- more clearer sense of self, a more defined clarity for who I am and what I genuinely bring to the table as myself, that my goals became more defined. Ted Slubersky in New York said something like, great, you want to be on TV. Okay. What type of show? What type of role? What level on the call sheet? What network? And I kind of started thinking with that level of definition, that and listening to Audrey Helps Actors, uh, (laughs) you know, you know, it just, it changed how my approach. So let's talk also a little bit about what that clarity is and what you bring to the table in terms of being a gender non-binary, transgender. I don't want to speak about it for you. So tell everyone a little bit about that. So I am trans. I also identify as Mm non-binary. And I think a lot of my clarity I found in the industry came from this radical sense of self, this radical queerness I discovered within myself. You know, I've always been queer since I was like two seconds old. I've always Mm -hmm. had that. But, you know, I didn't know where exactly I could fit in the industry. I always had this very cloudy, I should say, idea of what it meant to be an actor and what I needed to do and how I needed to look and present in order to be successful. Mm -hmm. Like I had to strip away my queerness in order to find success. Yeah. I just love all of that too, because I think a big thing that actors deal with when they start to get clear, not even just clear on sense of self, but clear on the kind of career. I think a big thing that happens to actors is you can feel like you're going to lose things. So like if you're getting 
40 auditions a year, which would be amazing for anyone out of college. But like, let's say you got 40 auditions a year and you felt like if I really honed in on like my authenticity and my sense of self, and we'll talk a little bit about, it's not like you're only playing you. It's like through you, you can transform into other people. So I don't want people listening to think that it's just like you have a sense of self. So now you play yourself everywhere. No way. No, thank you. I'm not interested in that, actually. And <laughs> right. I, like that's like I think I'm pretty great, but that sounds pretty boring. But yeah, I think that that tends to be a thing, too, is people are like, well, I didn't decide to be an actor to just be myself. Why it takes courage and why it is a risk is because in getting specific with what you bring to the table. And I think it's a much more interesting way of saying it than like you're casting. Like here's my casting. Here's I my hate casting. That so you know? much because because <laughs> but I because I think that your casting limits you. When someone says right. you're casting, I find that so limiting. And I think that's yeah. ultimately what really limited me from existing for a long time. Back in middle school, high school, mm -hmm. when I was mm -hmm. told, you know, by someone who I love very much that mm -hmm. I wouldn't get into college unless I became a more neutral version of myself. And uh -huh. those words stung in me for years. One thing I do want to talk about with that, too, is I think when you have something like being transgender, like being gender non-binary, that the clarity with which you have to bring and own your authenticity, it really asks a lot of you because you're coming up against a lot of confront all the time. So I really am excited by the courage and the ownership that then allows you the strength to pull forward your team, to be the point person of how you are represented and representing yourself in media. Well, and here, here's the funny part. Mm. And any trans or non-binary actors listening is going to know exactly what I'm talking about. There will be an audition and mm. casting producers, whomever, they have no idea what the hell they want. And you, yeah. you'll have trans men get called in for the same role as trans women. You'll have mm. black women, white women, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Every, every different type of trans person getting called in for the same role. And you yeah. walk into the room and you see the same 30 people. And it's like, oh, hey, we're all up for this. Great. We are all such different types, mm, drastically so different types, where one person yeah. is like a comedy genius. The other couldn't make crack a joke just to save <laughs> yeah. their life. And it can often be really frustrating to mm. know that the qualifier for you getting called into that room is just because yeah. you're trans or just because yeah. you're, you're whatever, something like that. And it's yeah. That can be frustrating because it's like, mm -hmm. I want you to see me and what else I bring to the table as mm -hmm. an actor. And I think mm -hmm. since Big Sky has come out, I've been able to kind of break past that a little bit more mm -hmm. in the auditions I'm getting called in for. Mm -hmm. I love that perspective, too, because it's realizing like, you know, they're working so much with stereotypes and that sort of is the base that they're coming off of. And what is so beautiful about what we do as actors is we take a stereotype and we go, no, and we fill it through empathy and humanity mm -hmm. and compassion and humor and life. And it's got to be yours. It's your life that you are breathing into it. Even if you adopt that little magic of like, transformation of feeling like, boy, I have transformed into something. It's still coming through you and your palette and your experiences, which is why you can do a role like four years ago and then look at those sides from four years ago and think, God, I would do that totally. Totally different because yeah. you've grown and you've grown, yeah. not just in skill, but in life. Mm -hmm. and now, exactly. Like I, I can't wait in 40 years to look back and see how I view material differently. Yeah. So for Big Sky, I play Jerry Kennedy. It's a show on ABC. She is an aspiring musician. She's trans. She lives in Montana. The breakdown for the role was low-key problematic, and it was not in a way that I identified. It was like looking for a gay man in drag mm. who is as womanly passable as possible. This is what's so crazy and great about, I think, being leading edge, is when you're leading edge like you are, you're going to fulfill it in your life experience and with humanity in a way that somebody writing a breakdown won't. And one of the best things I heard about breakdowns was breakdowns actually aren't for the actor. 
it's for the agent to understand who to submit. And I rewrite my breakdowns because if I read the breakdown, I'm like, ah, then I have this idea of what it is. And so I like will literally write it like myself. I'm like searching for woman, <laughs> Caucasian, 30s to 40s, tall, bossy, but cute chipmunk cheeks. She can say harsh things, but everyone lets it slide by. Big heart but a little overbearing. And then I'm like, this rolls perfect yeah. for me. <laughs> Changes that to every single, every yeah. single breakdown. Yeah, <laughs> and then it helps me bring myself yeah. to the role. I think I just got, genuinely, it, it scared me. That character description scared me because I went in unsure if I would be protected. Because mm-hmm. I had, I did have this gut feeling I was going to book it. And it felt all of a sudden like I was going to get everything I ever wanted. And it was going to be scary. And I would have to fight for myself. And I wasn't sure if anyone would fight for me. I think being a queer person in Hollywood, you, Mm -hmm. even on the most progressive of sets, will often face hardships. And, you know, I'd be lying if I said my heart wasn't broken a few times on jobs I love. Yes, that's right. With characters that you love. Characters that you love, yeah. Do you feel that through you taking on this role that you have helped or added to a little bit of a better understanding of what that identification is? I like to think I've had a small hand in that. But, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of (laughs) powerful people about who this character is, how she probably identifies. I mean, this is ABC we're talking. Yes, Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. a slightly grittier show than perhaps some others, but to play a trans truck stop sex worker who's an aspiring Mm -hmm. musician who gets kidnapped and then uh, yada yada, not going to spoil the season if you haven't seen Mm -hmm. it, but Mm -hmm. that alone is a risk. It felt like this role existing as a series regular was a risk. Mm -hmm. And if I wasn't going to advocate for myself and for the character, no one would. And the output in the universe, like the product being put out there, if it was wrong, Mm -hmm. I put so much pressure on myself. Mm -hmm. I cried so many nights thinking about both the positive and the negative of it, you know, Mm -hmm. of thinking of some small town, some queer kid in like Indiana, seeing themselves on TV for the first time Mm -hmm. or the second time, whatever, you know, seeing themselves represented, but then also in the same breath, if it was done wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the people who would latch onto that And associate Mm -hmm. me with that shortcoming. Representation is powerful, but it is scary as hell. Mm. I had a really real conversation with my publicist about it. And he said, you have to remember the audience you're serving. It's a network drama, which serves a lot of households who probably aren't watching HBO, who probably aren't watching all of these shows that may be on streaming or whatever. And your reach with a role changes depending on the project you know like abc versus any of them it's just a different audience and Mm -hmm. not one is not better than the other it's just i feel a sense of duty to Mm -hmm. use this opportunity to the best of my power and do the best that i can so that i am not the last queer person on tv that hopefully uh, this becomes a staple like cast queer people in roles that have nothing to do with their sexuality or their gender cast a full-figured woman over 50 in a role that has nothing to do with her being full-figured and over 50. Like, people are people. The world is so big and beautiful and diverse. And, you know, I'm skinny and white and relatively pretty, and there's a lot of privilege afforded to me for that. And, you know, there's still so many places where I want to see a queer person who hasn't been there yet. I'm going to tell you the story about my black car driver who watches Big Sky, and we talked about you. Oh, my God. What is a black car? A black car is like when you get the black car from the airport to whatever, you know. Because she is booked and blessed. Because she's booked and blessed, you guys. (laughs) I was like, oh, my God. You know, I have just recently had chatted with you and specifically discussing audiences, a network television show, and who's watching that. And then the important power of that representation And the limitations of it that are, to me, similar to, like, you know, the limitations of doing a play in a black box versus the limitations of doing a play in a corporate, you know, the American Airlines Theater on Broadway. Like, they both have things about them that are restrictive and also give a lot of permission, depending on which direction you're looking at. 
that's a great way to word that restrictive versus giving permission. That's yes. That's yeah. And in both areas, there's both pros and cons everywhere you go. Everywhere you go. Trade-offs, as we like to Trade-offs. call Trade-offs. Love that. Trade-offs. So this black car driver, I don't even remember how the conversation got started, but he was talking about trans. I'm not immediately uncomfortable. And it wasn't like uh, having a conversation with me is what made him uncomfortable. He was just uncomfortable having any conversation around it. And I was saying, oh, yeah, well, you know, there's that character on Big Sky. And he's like, oh, my wife loves that show. And I was like, yeah, really good show. And he's like, yeah. And so then he started talking about you. And you could tell he was just like really uncomfortable. And I corrected him because he could only refer to you as he. That's all he could do. It was like systems do not connect. <laughs> like, Oh, like girl, the don't get me started. <laughs> don't get me started. It felt kind of like an uncomfortable glitch in the communication. And I said to him something like, it's new. It's new to a lot of people. And that's okay. Like, you don't have to feel uncomfortable about it. We're all learning new and, and expanding and all of that. And then he was like, well, I mean, I don't feel uncomfortable about it. And I was like, okay. Um, you know, <laughs> okay, sir. Okay. Sure you don't. <laughs> I, think, I think you do. And also, like, it's okay. It's okay. And, and you know what? I'll say I have a strong suspicion that the same men who are all up in my DMs mm. are the same mm-hmm. men who are very uncomfortable in talking about Arrow. my character. And it's yes. for no reason other than there's a stigma around queer people. And, you know, I'm playing someone who is, I don't want to say sexualized because I'm just like wearing I didn't pants. Think sexy. But like, thanks. But, you, you know, it's like you're wearing skin tight pants and like all, all, yeah. all this stuff on TV. And people will DM me and just be mm-hmm. like, you are so hot. You're so sexy. I'm not gay. And it's like, sir, you can. Oh, uh, and I get that so many times or just like, you have no idea what you do to straight guys like me. And it's like, okay, like, okay. honey, enjoy the, enjoy the view. Don't fight it. Like, like, <laughs> le- but, and, and it, that's the thing. It's like, I see it. I see it in conversations mm-hmm. with people when like a cameraman will refer to me as sir. And it's like, mm-hmm. I know you don't mean it, but your brain is short circuiting and you can appreciate the view without having to disrespect it. <laughs> when you said short circuit, I think that's very accurate. And watching right? it happen in real time is... It gets exhausting to be aged. Ne- oh, ne- needing sure. to have thick skin yeah. is like, yeah. I don't need my skin to be thicker. It's thick enough. Leave me alone. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But I thought it was such an important moment for us to just talk about and to let you know about because, you know, his wife is watching the show and he's going to watch the show by proxy. And like, mm-hmm. we had a conversation that was uncomfortable for him. And then the next one will be less uncomfortable. And this moment of short circuiting the brain in an expansion of what is, is so important. And I truly believe that if that show were on some niche, cool platform for people who wanted to seek it out and it was, you know, sort of what I call Hollywood hit, I don't think that he and his wife would watch that show. And I don't think those conversations would happen. I think you're right. And I think that's something I've had to remind myself a a Mm -hmm. few times. And Mm -hmm. It's not just for the little queer kid in Indiana who looks up at the TV and sees me. It's also that person's parents yeah. and their grandparents. Yeah. I recently said in an interview, I started therapy before the show came out. Mm. And I was really uncomfortable talking about it. But I was like, you know what? I did. I started therapy before the show came out. One, everyone should, everyone should be in therapy. It's great. But it's purely to steal myself, to prepare myself for this like conservative backlash that I was expecting. Mm-hmm. And it didn't happen. It was actually the opposite. It was people who I was getting so many messages, even like friends in real life saying like, oh, my grandma who is 85 and has consistently hated on trans people, on gay people, on queer people, blah, 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 blah. Jerry is her favorite character on Big Sky. And she's like, we've had some real heart to heart conversations. And it's just knowing that even if there was only one conversation like that that happened, Mm -hmm. okay, the role had an impact. Great. And there's more. I mean, one of my favorite things that I learned over the last year, which is like way too old for me to learn about this thing, but the law of exponential theory. And I learned it through COVID that it's like two people get it, which then infect four people and those four people affect four people and those four people affect four people. And so that it's like, it just explodes so fast. And I feel like that's what momentum is, is it starts with like three actors who get this experience in representation on television and then that 
ignites four other actors getting the opportunity, which ignites each of them getting four other actors the opportunity until it can become something that is mainstream and is now just like a part of human experience that there are people just as there are people who identify in any range of the sexual spectrum that in terms of gender fluidity or gender identity, the same thing is true there as well. Yeah. And there have been a few conversations about Jerry's transness on the show. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. But the role has surpassed that. Yes. And in conversations about what a season two will look like, Mm -hmm. I'm really hoping we dive in. You have members of certain communities on a show, use them and tell the stories that need to be told. You know, if nothing else, like it's such a great fucking character and such a great place for literally what is drama somebody who is not understood and who has the courage and also the confidence that you've given your character is such a great place for like evergreen drama which i just love well we shall see but wait jesse you delicious vixen you wait i have to interrupt you Help me. I need some help. And now it's time for Listener Questions. I'm so scared. Today's Listener Question is brought to you by Carla Zuniga Hair. That's Carla Zuniga Hair. Everybody goes to Carla. Carla is flexible. Carla is fabulous. Carla is a curl master. If you are looking for a dramatic change, or if you are looking for somebody that you just feel like has confidence, that you just feel like is going to give you a good haircut... The best thing for me about Carla is actually that Carla goes slowly, especially when you're making a dramatic change. You know, you've had those haircuts where you're like, I think I'm going to get bangs. And then suddenly you're like, ah, not those bangs. If you do something dramatic or drastic, Carla is like, goes slow and gets you to a place. And it's like, how about this length? How about these bangs? How about this shape? How is this looking for you? So that you're constantly sort of just molding and shaping and shifting. Carla works outside in a beautiful backyard with beautiful shade and beautiful surroundings. And it is COVID safe and COVID compliant. And if you are listening to this, thank God, after we have closed up this whole shit show of a pandemic, please go on Carla's Instagram. She responds to direct messages. Carla Zuniga Hair on Instagram for all of your fabulous hair cutting needs. If you have a listener question, please call in 667-ACTOR-70. That's 667-ACTOR-70 for all your listener question needs. All right, so today I'm actually going to read a listener question that I got because I think you guys are all really going to vibe with this right now. You know, it's May, June, like it's always a slow time in the industry for many people. It's why I do self-tape May in May. And this person is just feeling the struggle. So I thought we could have a discussion. So this person says, right now I'm going through and I want to give up moment. This evening I did one of those pay to play type classes where you perform a scene to an agent or CD in hopes that you might spark interest. In the workshop, we had a short Q and A where the agent stated many times that if you don't have legitimate TV or film work under your belt, nobody is going to look at your submission for representation. Casting doesn't look at you for roles. And I asked the big question, How are we supposed to get legit work if no one will represent us or take us seriously without legit work? It's that classic Catch-22. And he said, I don't know, it's a tough industry. At this point, I feel so stuck. I moved to New York when I was 19. I got a tour right away. And then my career kind of took a little bit of a hit, even though I thought, wow, this is it, this is going. And then I booked this other show and I thought, well, this is it. And then it was not. My biggest struggle, though, is I feel like nobody wants to help us little guys. And then they said in parentheses, you're the only person I found who does. I try. I do. I really try. And then this person says, and I get it. Nobody has the time to be holding our hands through the other side. But there is just so much contradictory information. And we're told, as well as a ton of gatekeeping, my questions almost always are answered with, I don't know, it's a tough industry. I feel like it's an uphill battle and I'll never reach the top of it. I guess my main question for you is, how do people do this? How do people 
do this? I know that may seem like a silly question, but I really don't know. How do people get someone to take a chance on them without spending thousands of dollars on pay to plays where nine of 10 classes, they leave feeling exactly how I feel? How do people break into an industry where nobody looks twice if you aren't already somewhat successful and working? It all feels impossible. So I just want to first give you so much love and empathy. And if you are an actor listening and you are in this place, I just want to like say, yes, I understand. And I want to like hug you and say, yeah, this is hard. This is challenging. And when you say, how do people do this? My real honest answer is actually that most people don't. The math is not in our favor. Most people that I was in acting class with in my 20s they're not doing this anymore. And people decide to make life choices as their lives continue to grow and expand. And the discovery of what the career is versus what you thought it was going to be is continually shocking. I just want you to know it's continually shocking and surprising. And you're kind of signing up for a journey of like a lot of shock and awe. And there's a lot of incredible, gorgeous, beautiful moments. And, you know, it's sort of like with all of the bright lightness that comes with it comes the real dark devastation too. It's the pendulum swings. And the reason I have this podcast, the reason I'm so passionate about continuing to do the podcast even is because I want people to know what they're signing up for. I just like got so mad that everyone in like an attempt to like sell, just sort of not giving the full scope of what the lifestyle, the lifelong lifestyle of being an actor is. And it didn't dawn on me for a long time and I still get shocked by it. I have to tell you, I'm still shocked by it. And then not only to know what the lifestyle is, but then to not get jaded and bitter and frustrated, but to keep your heart open and full and passionate and continue to love the work. This profession is extremely expensive. And for every casting director that you hear who tells you they love props, you're gonna hear a casting director who tells you they hate them. And that is confusing. And for every acting teacher that tells you don't do workshops, you'll have tons of actors who are working who said, definitely I got all my first credits off of workshops. So it is frustrating. And what I wanna say to you is a pursuit as an artist in late stage capitalism is tough. It's always been tough, but it's tough. And my friend Katie, shout out to Katie, she said it so well. She said, you have to balance this hunger and drive and passion with some patience. And it's okay to have moments of frustration. And it's definitely okay and encouraged to always be reevaluating for yourself Is this the life that you want to sign up for? Because the frustration that you feel and the devastation that you've made progress in these like gaps and spurts, and then you thought it was going to lead to something and then it didn't. I am very sad, truly, to tell you that is the rest of your career. And you just learn to deal with it. And again, you'll have moments of like, yes, and I killed it and I booked it and I made all this money and everyone wants to talk to me at a party and like, I feel so accomplished and I got this amazing day on set today and I did this incredible audition and I collaborated with this incredible director and the show and I, we were vibing this whole show. Like you will have those moments too. But these spurts of success, even for actors who you know their name, you know their face, if you really look at their career over a lifetime for the vast majority, and I mean with the exception of like a handful of like maybe 20 actors on the whole, you will work and you will have pops of feeling cool and feeling accomplished and feeling like you have momentum. And you will then have them followed by extreme 
desert droughts. And actors with incredible success who have resumes that you would kill for get dropped by their agents all the time. People who have series regulars that I'm friends with can't get a meeting, can't get a meeting with an agent. Great actors, great to work with, can't get a meeting with an agent. And that's real. So the life of the actor isn't actually that you get momentum and it gets easier and you get momentum and it gets easier and you get momentum and it gets easier. Parts of it get easier, parts of it don't change, and parts of it get more expensive and parts of it get harder. And that's why when you meet actors who are really working consistent actors of a certain age, they are humble, man. They are a humble, humble group. So my love to you, if this journey sounds like something that you want to have a lifelong relationship with, or at least a life for now relationship with, then all my love and support to you. And if this feels like, Audrey, are you saying that really truly doesn't change? My experience of all of the friends and all the working actors that I'm friends with and everybody that I know, no, the peaks and valleys don't change. They don't change. And that's why to me, the career is truly an act of service because when you get paid well, you get paid really well, but then you will not get paid for a while for most actors. So all my love, all my compassion, and I hope this is bringing you at least some camaraderie and some compassion. What you're experiencing is normal and it's part of the career. And now back to your regularly scheduled program. So I do wanna talk about this transition you had in your career in terms of Big Sky erupted and and came into your life and brought you the super big show show that you're about to go film. (laughs) I'm so so excited. I'm so excited. (laughs) One of the things that I really want to have you and I have a conversation about is sort of the implementing of your authenticity to other actors. You know, you're now in a position with the experience that you've had of going from a person on the fucking subway in New York, like can't get arrested in an acting job to now being where you're at in a matter of really four-ish years. It's so funny, like four years when you're on the beginning of four years feels like that's going to be forever. But four years when you're on the other side of the mountain is like, that wasn't like impossible. And I'd love for you to talk about getting better at the business side of it so that you can really show off your work? Well, the podcast coming out every week kept me grounded. Listening to that every week made me feel these goals are attainable. These are small, actionable steps I could take along the way. Each tiny, tiny thing, making sure my headshot represents me, making sure my reps understand me, keeping in touch with reps, taking these classes. You know, I was doing casting director workshops all the time. And uh, like you made it seem so clear of like how much research you need to do mm, on the mm-hmm. show on on what is out there and mm-hmm. me and one of my best friends we would just research every day every single mm-hmm. day mm-hmm. what is coming out who is casting it how do we get there how do we do this watching shows watching shows watching shows watching shows i watched so much television that all mm-hmm. i wanted to do was tv I love that. And was that a transition for you from like your conservatory life? Like, did you just like leave thinking like it's check off all day, every day and then go, oh, in college, I was like, oh, I never want to do TV. I never want to do film. Mm. I theater only. And theater it, only, yeah. I because I was scared. I was scared yeah. of TV and film because I was like, oh, my God, it's going to live forever. And mm, that's interesting. It's, it's true. It does. But also at the time, all I was consuming was theater. That's exactly. all I wanted. Well, you focus on expands, it, right? Totally, totally, yeah. totally, totally. And I couldn't get enough of TV. It was an insatiable appetite. I would see shows and be like, oh, I want to do that role. I love that. Can you think of one? Piper Chapman in Orange is the New Black. Oh my God, love. Like, with love. There are just so many roles that were so like rich and so good. And oh my God, Kate Blanchett and Mrs. America, sign me up. Uh. <laughs> um, you, you know, like, yeah. there's so much richness on television. Uh-huh. And I was like, 
every time I watched a show, it made me more excited. And when I got mm. an audition that was good, I'd be like, yes, I want to mm. do this. And really, the, the podcast got me excited about auditioning. I fell in love with auditioning. I think I've always been great at faking it, like fake it till you make it. Having a, the consistency of the podcast just made me feel, okay, not only is this possible, not only are you seeing your friends achieving certain successes, but here are all these other people who like this person had this path, this person had that path. And here is how they found their successes every little step of the way. And just getting excited about auditioning made my auditions really good. I think I'm good at auditioning because I enjoy it. I'm sure that you are. Yeah, yes, I, 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 I really that. enjoy it. And self-tapes, oh, sign me up. I love doing self-tapes over Zoom. Another one of my best friends, we like Zoom self-tapes for each other, like a Zoom reader. Mm -hmm. And I'll like put my sides up on the computer and I'll like fake it sometimes. If I, in some of my best auditions, I booked super so show show show. <laughs> I was familiar with it. I had prepped it, mm -hmm. but I booked it like that. You know, it's like, yeah. I love auditioning. Yeah, I love that. Can you tell anyone who's listening, who's feeling brokenhearted about auditioning or who's feeling frustrated or who feels like, fuck auditions. I mean, because I felt that way. And it's part of why I'm so passionate about on the podcast is I felt like this is bullshit. None of this has anything to do with what we're going to go on set and do. I was just like mad about it for a long time because I felt like if you gave me the role, I would be brilliant in it. That was my like arrogant point of view about it. And so the fact that you're going to give me like one take or that you're going to send one take in a self tape like that to me, just I felt like so fucking mad about it. And the transition to really enjoying the audition process, we're going to be auditioning for the rest of our lives. Yeah, your job is to audition. Mm -hmm. And then you get to act. At least while you're not booked on a show or not booked on a movie or a project, your job is to audition. And if that's mm -hmm. the only opportunity you're getting to act, like show them what you got. You just spent four years at that school. You just spent eight months at that program. You just spent right. three weeks in that class. Like get your money's worth. There's definitely roles that come up even still where I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this. I, I'm not inspired to do this. I'm depressed. I'm sad. Mm -hmm. I'm hungry. Mm -hmm. I don't have time. Well, what do you My do lighting looks moments? bad. Power through. Yeah. Do you have people that you can call or that you rely on to like give you their life force to sort of help you inject yourself? Yeah. You know, I've been away filming for the past nine or 10 months. So right. I've only had friends really available over Zoom. But other actors who are just like, yeah, this sucks. Or like, okay, yeah, this writing's bad. Like, all right, let's just power through. Let's get a let's good tape. No, out. that's not good. Like, all right, your <laughs> eyeline looks better over here. You're so talented. Uh -huh. This is great. Uh -huh. Like, and, uh -huh. and really like coaching you through it. Like your cheer squad. Your cheer squad. Honestly, yeah. you don't need a lot of friends. You just need a couple yeah. good ones. And like, yeah, you know, so have good. your friends who are not actors, have your friends mm -hmm. who are actors and actors mm -hmm. who you admire. And I don't, I don't mean that in like a celebrity way, like mm -mm. surrounding yourself by people who inspire you. Mm hmm. That's a game changer. That's yeah. a game changer. And I'm not saying what their career looks like. That mean, that mm -hmm. doesn't mean much. But people who inspire you to be the best version of yourself. I think about that way about my fiance. I think about the way about my small group of best friends. Like mm -hmm. all people who inspire me to be the best me I can. And, you know, a lot of days that's hard. A lot of days that's hard. Yeah. I'm so glad we're talking about it because the next thing I want to talk about with you is self-tapes, managing energy, God, I love to talk about like phase four. Like I love like a phase four conversation when you're like, got your show, like every actor I meet is like, and then my series. And I'm like, okay, well, there's a lot to that that deserves knowledge and prep in just like kind of what you did of like, you know what, I'm going to go be this character. I better get in therapy because I don't know what kind of backlash I'm getting. Like that is such great pre-paving of a problem and like setting yourself up for success before so you're not just like slapped in the face because a series regular is the most energy. It's so encompassing. It is so much harder than I ever thought it would be. Yeah. Tell me about that. I think first and foremost, it makes me think of all the roles I cried over that I didn't get or I got close to mm. for years when I was like, I am ready. I am ready. Give mm. me that role. Give me that chance. Mm. I was not. I was barely ready for this one. And, and I, tell me what that means. Tell me what you weren't ready for that now you feel like you understand that. Like I can think back there. There was a series regular like four years ago that I knew I was going to get and I did not. And I probably would have quit acting if I had gotten it because I would be lying if I said this experience didn't make me 
contemplate that before. You know, sure. it's the pressure to succeed. It's mostly self-driven. This idea that every tiny little thing is so big, important, and precious. And the weight of that and the weight of all of a sudden being exposed to millions of people and the fear of it, and especially adding a layer of like being trans and transphobia mm -hmm. and femphobia mm -hmm. and, you know, doing press. Press is exhausting. It's exhausting. Nobody told me that. I have to say, they were like, it's expensive. They didn't tell me what that meant. Oh, so oh. the whole episode, just so everyone... No. Press is expensive. I it's adore expensive. my publicists. I don't regret it for a moment. But you're spending thousands of dollars a month. And you're not even doing carpets. Like, and imagine I, if you were adding carpets to that because you've been doing it during a pandemic. I wish I was doing carpets. I want to walk with carpets <laughs> you will be, so baby. You, will be. <laughs> you got it. It's coming. It's coming. I hope so. But, you know, it's it's just of not knowing how one tiny little phrase can become a headline. I mean, me saying I went to therapy became a headline, and then that headline was copied like 15 times in other articles. Mm -hmm. Or how I misspoke in one of my first interviews. Basically, I was trying to tell the story of how I went to the producers and we had a conversation about my character on Big Sky and like who she was. Mm -hmm. And that turned into I have input on the writing, which I, I don't have input, like no power over that. There were so many articles that were tagging me like, blah, 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 blah. Jesse did a great job. Here's some shortcomings, even though Jesse had some input on the role. I'm like, OK, uh, fuck you all, first of all. Second, yeah. like all the leads of the show had to do these huge press junkets, especially at the beginning. And someone flubbed on Good Morning America live oh, and God. they spoiled the ending of the pilot. I felt so heartbroken for that person because I was like, you know, the pressure. That's what I was never ready for. Mm -hmm. And I just want to contextualize that for everybody. So like the pressure that you as an actor feel having gone and done your first co-star and that sense of like, oh my God, do I have the line right? Oh my God, do I have the line right? Oh my God, do I have the line right? Oh my God, do I have the line right? And then the feeling of uncomfortableness, despite feeling like you should be feeling remarkably prepared for your one line on blah, blah, blah show. But the pressure that you feel just to say your one line today just multiply that to 10 months. And I think that there's this idea that like once you have this show and then once you're there for 10 months, that like there's just this like comfortability. And there is, my experience, I'm not obsessing about the one line, but I am obsessing about how this scene went today or how I see maybe a way I looked and I'm like, oh, that's definitely how I wanted to look in that scene. Like, That's the worst. I'd be lying if I said otherwise, but I definitely mm -hmm. left my first season as a series regular with different insecurities than I went in with. Oh, not necessarily more, not necessarily less. I think I became a stronger actor after filming 16 episodes. How could you not? You definitely right. do. I became mm -hmm. more confident and not just like, yeah, I'm confident. I became more confident to perfect example. Episode one, there were certain things about the character where I was like, that doesn't feel right. And I, I like mm -hmm. bit my tongue or like I didn't if I didn't like a certain piece of the costume, whatever. 16 episodes in and I'm not advising anyone to like tell directors no, but mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. I had not only the confidence, but the knowledge of who this character was to be like, no, that's not right. This is correct. And again, not in like a shitty way. No, just in a, a collaborative way. Yeah. And I think so often as young actors, as queer people, as women, as et cetera, et cetera, we're kind of always taught to just minimize. Well, yes, and. Yes. We're taught to allow other people to be in control. Mm -hmm. And something I learned from this experience was it is okay to take up space. You should take up space, and you're not taking up as much space as you think you are. Especially as a lead, your job is to lead. So when you're a series regular, that's how I view it, is like, I'm always looking at the number one through five on the call sheet and just sort of seeing like, how are you leading? Like, what's the tone you're setting for this set? Because when you're a lead, you're part of the group that is there all day, every day, literally running the set with everyone. And everyone sort of takes off of your energy and your point. I think a lot about managing energy on larger roles and long shows like what you're doing. Like, what do you do? <laughs> it depends. It definitely depends. I have become a frequent bather. Oh, God, I love a bath. 
good God, I bad <laughs> saved me during these past yeah. 10 months. It just con- to contextualize. Big Sky was filmed. We were originally shooting in New Mexico. The pandemic happened. A week into production for the pilot, we were shut down and sent home. We started back up in late July in Vancouver, Canada, and the border is closed. So we all had to like, quarantine for two weeks, et cetera, et cetera, COVID, blah, 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 blah. The border was closed, so we could not travel back and forth. Our family could not visit. So we were there until production ended. So I left a week ago. And adding that to it all, being alone, kind of just like sitting around waiting to work, Mm -hmm. there were periods of horrible depression. Of course. Because it's like, what am I doing? I'm just sitting here on my couch. If and when you get the beautiful chance to travel for work, spend a little extra money and get a nicer place because you're going to be spending way more time there than you think you will. I couldn't agree with that more. I had two apartments. My first one was a hellhole that was like the size of a closet. And the second one was so freeing that it, oh my God, I, I was homesick for it when I left like a week ago. So I say, first and foremost, have a place where you can call home. Take care of your environment take care and of your set environment. it up to be happy. Yep. And if you're in a hotel room, I'm currently in a hotel room for Super Secret Show Show and Mm -hmm. just got to make it home. Yeah, I'm so with you. One of the best piece of advice I heard was a friend of mine who's, it's good, you guys, to have a few friends who are a little ahead of you in their careers. And I remember asking them, like, any advice in terms of, like, when you're in a hotel or when you're on location? And one of my friends said, you know, get a hotel with the extra room so that the bedroom is not where the desk and everything is, like you can close it off. And she said, it's just nice to have like a little space that you feel like is yours. That's not where you're sleeping if you're going to be there forever. Well, that was the problem with my first apartment because it was all, it was like one room. It was a studio. One room. So it's, yeah. You'll learn on set which actors you can hang out with mm-hmm. before you're seen and which ones you can't. Mm-hmm. Some people are either take more energy than they give or give more energy than Mm. you need in that moment Mm. and airpods are your friend keep your headphones around and it's not personal just so everyone knows like not at all it's okay like actors do really understand if you've got to like seclude yourself i'm gonna be sobbing in 20 seconds so i need i need a minute i need to compose myself having confidence that you know it and even Mm. if you don't that is okay you'll figure it out you are working a lot you are doing a lot you have a lot of lines it's okay to mess up They can remind you what the line is if you forget. And I think removing that pressure to just have fun, play, 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 play. Even if the scene is you sobbing in a shipping container after you're being kidnapped and tased 10 times, like play. There's freedom in the relationships between characters. And I think when I stopped taking myself so seriously, I had more fun. And when I had more fun, the role was the work was better. Do you have an intention for yourself? on sets like do you have an intention of as a presence on set I know for me my intention is always to breathe life into the set so you know if I'm a guest star actor I know that the leads are often really tired and doing a like just like you're saying doing a lot all the time and so I'm always trying to come in and bring a lot of life force and bring a lot of energy so that I'm giving that gift to everyone that week or two or four, however I'm on the show for. And then if I'm a lead, I really am always looking to be really ingratiating and make people feel comfortable when I'm not doing a scene that requires me to, you know, need to really protect my space, but otherwise to be really ingratiating and make people feel comfortable and welcomed. I don't know that I do. The more time went on, the more I needed consistent time for myself. I needed to protect mm-hmm. myself at every turn because that distance away from home and that just the time really was so, I was so vulnerable. There there were weeks, 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 weeks at a time that I couldn't make it through the day without sobbing. Onset, offset, mm-hmm. didn't matter. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that has nothing to do about the quality of the work environment, but just mm. we are so tired doing that work in a fucking pandemic, pandemic which yeah. i can't wait in 50 years to look back and be like mm-hmm. yes we made a tv show during the pandemic for real so cool yeah, yeah. but protect yourself you know it's mm-hmm. it's a hard it's a weird balance acting is such a weird job because 
you want to show up on set and be a good source of energy. You want people to say, I loved working with Jesse. She was so good. She was great to have around. Newer lines, showed up, did the thing. It wasn't a diva, yada, yada, yada. But then also to say you advocate for yourself. You advocate for the character. You listen. You take direction. You have good ideas. It's tough. I think Kylie Bunbury is the lead mm-hmm. of the show. She mm-hmm. is the most outrageously gracious and kind and such a beaming light of positivity. When the day comes that I'm a number one on a show, I hope I bring that energy to to a set. Mm-hmm. 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 I feel like my career is just starting, which is funny because I've been, I feel like I've been at this for a century. Anyone listening, you are not as far away as it feels. You never know, truly. And I think about it so often how I almost denied this audition for Big Sky, how Mm. I did not want Mm. to do it. And um, it's crazy. It's crazy what what one audition can do, what one audition and 10 months of work can do. And the years of preparation and training and stealing yourself and reps and headshots and blah, 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 how all that got you there. That's what I mean. But you have worked deliberately to like problem solve. And I just think that that's what I really want people to understand is it's like you have a problem called nobody is hiring you. (laughs) Like you have to solve that problem because everything is solvable. Are you going to do what's required? I used to think that like the people that won the awards won the awards because they were like the best actors. And I feel like what they're really winning the awards for is problem solving for like a survival to a thriving in this industry. When you know what that is, like that's what deserves like a fucking statue for everyone. I think about it too. Like, and this only came about recently when in conversations with my reps being like, I picture your career looking like this and that and this and things I never ever dreamed being possible. And it's like, what do you picture your career as? Do you want to walk a carpet? Okay, great. You go to this event, walk that carpet. All right, now what? Like, like there's, yeah, whoop, whoop to do. Like, you look great yeah, in that dress. Exactly. Like, I've got a dress on. Happy for you. Then. It cost you a thousand dollars to attend. Yeah, I was like, going to say, for twelve hundred dollars, uh, that too can be you. Yeah. Like, unpack it. Let, like, strip it down. What are the, what's the nitty gritty of what you really want your career to look like? And I'm also a writer. I started writing mm-hmm. in college. I started writing with plays. I started doing this and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then the opportunity and the gift that was Big Sky afforded me the chance to actually get repped as a writer. And Mm. with that, I'm like, okay, so my dreams of being an executive producer is not only possible, I'm going to make it happen. And having a team of people behind you to say like, not only do I believe in you, but I also want that for you. And here are the avenues you can take to get there. Where I think I spent so many years just being like, I want to be an actor. I want to be an actor. I want to be an actor. I want to book that role. I want to book that role. I'm like, oh my God, so, so much pressure, so much pressure, so much pressure. I did not have the luxury of thinking 10 years, 20 years down the line because I was so worried about that one line on the blacklist. That one line was so precious that I put all of my worth as a person, all of my worth as an artist on that line. And if I did not book it, it was a direct attack against my value. Absolutely. Girl, that's not the case. That is not the case. case. That's not the case. That's why I'm always like, yeah, well, you need therapy. It's like your (laughs) co-star audition doesn't deserve that much pressure. It doesn't. And neither does your series regular audition. And neither does your series regular audition. Yeah. You'll do better work and you'll honor the work better by understanding like you have value inherent to you regardless of the bookings you do or do not have this week, regardless of the auditions you do or do not have this week. And the more that you can understand that, the better the experience of the whole career will be. Yeah, truly. It also goes to say, too, just I think in a capitalistic society, we're so often told quantity over quality. No, ma'am. Quality, quality, quality. If you get one audition, do your best. Make it good. Kill it. Kill it. And you don't have to book it. Because you know what? Mm-hmm. That casting director is going to call you in again because you booked it, because you were prepared. And even if they don't, you worked on it and you will be better for the next one. Everyone pays in acting class to act. And I'm like, this audition isn't even having you pay. They're just telling you act for free today. And then suddenly everyone's like, <laughs> and it's like, well, just pretend you're in acting class paying somebody $300 a week for you to do yeah, acting yeah, yeah. today <laughs> and then go do it. You know, this is going to be the closing episode for Self-Tape May. Ah! 
And I know you haven't participated in Self Tape Made, but I wanted to get your thoughts or feelings about self tapes for people, things that you've noticed work for you, help you book, what advice you have for other actors in terms of self tapes. You booked the super big show show off of a tape. So I booked super big show show off of a tape. And I actually think I did my best self tapes while working in Vancouver. I had not the greatest setup, not the best lighting, but it was good enough. I used my environment. I did not have the like actor blank wall behind me. I had like a bookshelf behind me. I was sitting at a table for most of them, but just being in the material, being a person. And I look back, I recently cleaned out my computer and saw some self tapes from like <laughs> 2014. And there's just this pursuit of perfection of like, I must get every single punctuation mm -hmm. mark where it's like, you're not a human, you're not a person. Mm -hmm. Even if you're not playing a human, there's so much richness in between the lines that is your job to add. Truly, there's so much to add and self-tapes are your opportunity to do it a thousand times. Get someone who doesn't care. Get someone who doesn't have anything to do for a couple hours and just go for it. And this is what I say to everyone is like you have to find your own technique. Like I have friends who are crazy about punctuation and word perfectness and then they only give themselves, you know, three takes. For some people, those restrictions get them in. Like, I'm going to look at the punctuation and every dot, 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 and every dash and every capital letter, and I'm going to do all of that. And that serves as like such like a sheet music that gets them in. And then the idea of like, I'm going to do three takes means that those three takes, they like hit it, they show up, they're prepared, they nail it. I'm not like that. I don't work well under those circumstances, but I know that about myself. And I know that about myself through my self-tape practice mm -hmm. and through working on material enough to know like... I like several takes. I like several takes when I am filming something on set. And I'm generally like a three to four take actor. Like we get it in three to four takes. And I like to tape and I like to watch and then see if I think the story is being told. That's it. What is the story? What is the story you're telling? I recently had an audition that was like, send two takes. And I was like, why? Why? But I was like, okay, how are they different? Yes. How are they different? Yeah. You emphasize the instead of was. Like, <laughs> it says that ain't different. You know, like, start at a different place. Like, that is mm -hmm. in your power. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we'll ever be in the room again, but in the yeah, room or know. in a self-tape, yeah, lean into it. It's yours. You want to use a book? Yeah. Use a book. Who cares? Use Who cares? What? Are they and not going to give I... you the role because you're holding a prop? Fuck off. Yes, oh, they I will. If, you're, if it's your role, it's your role. I'm yeah. assuming I can swear. No, I'm with you. <laughs> My husband says, and I thought this is so good, he was like, nobody ever booked a role because they had the lines right. And he's like, they will book the role. And one of the reasons might be that it's a particular writer and they want all the lines perfectly as written. But if they just have the lines perfect and that's what they've got, they're not booking that role. And for everyone listening, I love this stuff about like the book and all that stuff. If anything seems scary to you, if like a prop seems like, ah, you know, then like, don't wait till you have an audition to add a prop. Use props in your self-tape practice to see, does this work for you? If like two takes doesn't work for you, then do some self-tapes and purposely give yourself two takes and make sure that you do them differently and then hold on them and then watch them in six weeks and be like, were those different? I love that. And you know, I'll, I'll add to that. I think one silly trick that I love doing in auditions, in, in self-tapes at least, turn your chair around. Do the audition with the chair backwards and see mm -hmm. how much freer your whole body is. And you realize mm -hmm. just how constricted you were to a fucking chair. Or even sit in a fucking chair. I mean, that's a big one, too, is like, you know, I think so many of us start our self-tape experience being like good little actors, like doing a monologue for like, like, I can't move my I can't move my arms. I can't move my head. La, 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 I'm la, la. standing here and everyone said, don't move. And so the camera can see you and the eye line is here. And then it's like everyone's in this like box that they box themselves in. And it's like. Maybe sit down and like sit back. And, well, like... and especially if, if you are, come from theater, the trauma mm -hmm. of being told you're too big. Oh, my mm. God. Like, keep mm. me up at night. You know, know. <laughs> it does. Still does. It does. It does. And, yeah. That, and, yeah. Yeah. and there's, there's power in moments. 
take a moment. moment. It's your audition. Yeah. Take as much damn time as you want. And as long, you know, I, I think I also went through a period of time of being like, oh, I need to respond right now because that other person's line ended. I can, mm-hmm. I can respond in, internally before the words come out. When they say take the air out, it's because the scene is dragging. You can right. fill that air, though. Fill it. Fill it. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to mm-hmm. do with it's hard to do with an audition you got 10 hours earlier and it's eight pages long. Yeah. I know. I mean, it was so funny. The thing that I had just shot, they were my first day on set. The director was like, uh, that was great. I took great. I think slower. Like it was a 14 hour day. And the note I got all day was like, I think slower. I just think slower. And it's because it was a genre that really wanted to like live. Mm-hmm. And I'm so used to. A lot of the material I audition for and work on is is just like it's a pace because like we got to keep moving, keep people entertained, and people are doing their dishes while they're watching. And so you got to like grab them, keep them, you know. And I was like, oh right, like I'm gonna sit and I'm gonna listen, and I'm gonna think about my response sometimes, and then I'm going to say something yeah. appropriate as a response. And then also just this idea of like identifying for you what is something in your audition that you feel like it's lacking and then purposely working on fixing that thing. I mean, for me, it's preparation. Mm -hmm. I think so often, like I said earlier, I historically have been good at fake it till you make it. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing I've noticed is when I'm unprepared and I'm phoning it in. Ah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. And when I actually put in that extra hour of work, mm-hmm. that extra hour and a half of work, it makes a major difference. Mm-hmm. Major difference. That's good. And, and you know, going back to the, the one one take on your mm-hmm. self-tapes, mm-hmm. one take on set is real as hell, especially after so a 14-hour day and you got two scenes left to squeeze in in a half hour. Yeah. Like, it happens and it sucks yeah. and... Mm-hmm. You better bring it on that first take because you're tired and you've had a long day and so is everyone else and they can't go overtime again. And Mm -hmm. one take, sometimes that's all you get. But wait, Jesse, you delicious vixen you. Wait, I have to interrupt you. Help me. I need some help. And now it's time for listener questions. I'm so scared. This listener question is brought to you by weaudition.com, that's weaudition.com, promo code Audrey25. Listen, will you guys just do me a favor? Will you just tell everyone, don't forget, promo code Audrey25. It really helps us out. Jesse and I don't make money off of this podcast. We send all of our money to our editors. We have a sound editor, we have a podcast story editor, and we like to give them money so that they keep doing a good job. When you go to weaudition.com, promo code Audrey25, it helps us pay their bills. And artist to artist, really, you should be on We Audition working with actors, sign up, make some money. I can't tell you the number of actors that we had on during the Get Your Shit Together series and who we've had on as like major successes of their own careers. And so many of them had said the thing that made the biggest difference is actually reading with other actors. They would go on and they would read and work with other actors because then they started to understand story. They understood character. They understood character arc in a way that really helped them in their own auditions because when it's your role and it's your character, there's just like so much pressure on it. You can't see the forest from the trees. It's hard to learn that way. But going on and being a reader for other actors, going on and getting help, you know, everyone's like, I don't have a reader. I don't have a reader. It's like, you guys, I'm on We Audition all the time. I'm on all the time. I book jobs consistently after working with We Audition readers. So give it a go. Weaudition.com, promo code Audrey25. If you have a listener question, please call in 667-ACTOR-70. That's 667-ACTOR-70 for all your listener question needs. Hi, Audrey. My name is Nikki Velastro, and I'm in New York. First off, I'm sure you hear all the time, but thank you so much for this podcast. I can't even begin to explain how helpful it has been for me from more than just an actor's standpoint. But to avoid a ginormous tangent there, here's my question. So I know you harp about story, story, story all the time, and I feel like I'm starting to grasp that concept more and more. But I'm the type of person that is a hands-on learner, 
and also really benefits from real life examples. So I listen well, but then I need to see it in action. So do you think it would be possible to kind of give an example of an, of an audition that would be representative of understanding story and then the same audition, but in a way that doesn't do such a great job of emulating that? I think that's it. So thank you so much again. Hope you have a great day. Talk to you soon. Bye. Okay, so I love this question. I hope, first of all, that you went ahead and listened to last week's episode with the gentleman at the CW Room, the CWroom.com. Those gentlemen, I mean, Lee Aronson is one of the best writers. I mean, he's like worked on every massive hit comedy show since like the 80s. So if you didn't listen to that episode, please go listen to that episode. Before you do so, go ahead and go on to the link that we have from the show notes of last episode. Get the sides, download those sides, work on them yourself, and then go and listen to what they say about the characters in terms of character arc, in terms of casting, all of those sorts of things. Okay, so I'm going to give you two very clear examples of a time I told story poorly and I didn't get the job and a time that I told story wonderfully and I did get the job. Okay, so number one is my audition that I did poorly in telling story was an audition I had for Longmire. It was a self-tape and it was a red herring. So Longmire is a network one hour drama procedural and a red herring usually is one scene and they don't come back. It's a guest star, one scene, you know, the detective comes in and is like, hey, so you seem to have a problem with this person. Did you kill them? And they're like, no, nah, I didn't kill that person. But you know whom you might look at is so-and-so other person, and then they go to the other person. But the person who is the red herring, I now know, serves very much to represent the possibility that this person definitely killed them. So you want to, like, watch the actor playing the red herring role and go, well, that person definitely killed our victim of the episode. I didn't quite understand that at that time in my career. And so I was playing a very tired, overworked mom whose son had some disabilities and had to be fed through a feeding tube. And the doctor that was the victim who had died was responsible for the condition of her son. So she's exhausted, she's angry, she's frustrated, she's all these things. And I did it the way Audrey might do it. I was like listening really well and I was like feeling very present and emotive about the condition of my son. But something that I missed so clearly and I could see it when I went back to watch the person who booked the job and this is why I absolutely recommend doing this because you'll see what they're doing that is maybe the reason why they booked the job. The thing that they brought that is essential to the story is anger. And this is where Audrey Moore learned that she is a conflict averse actor. I'm a conflict soother. I don't like love conflict. And I'm not like afraid. I mean, I may be afraid, but I'm pretty waspy. I'm sort of like, oh, are you upset? Let me empathize with you and have camaraderies, you know, so I chill it all out, which is great for life, but not great for drama. So I realized that my audition was really like tired and emotional and frustrated and like a little upset, but not like in a way that you think, wow, this person definitely killed the doctor. And more importantly than that, like a line that I had in the script was, oh, my husband, we don't even see each other anymore. And so they should be like brought on thinking like, well, if she didn't kill this person, definitely her husband did, which should be represented by just how like angry, disgusted. And I think the character even says like, I didn't kill him, but I'm not sad that he's dead. You know, really in a way that sells the genre of the story as in like, I've hated this man so long for destroying my life, my husband's life and my child's existence that I wish I had killed him. So, you know, I didn't do that in a way that fulfilled the genre and the person that did it booked it. And it was an incredible lesson for me. And I now try to work with coaches that are conflict prone. So I work a lot with actors that they're all about conflict. They're conflict with everything. And it's a good balance because I sort of need somebody who's going to pull out the anger, the hatred, the conflict 
out of me for a lot of those roles. An example of a time when I told the story very well was on Silicon Valley. I booked the job of the makeup artist to Gavin Belson, who he's a character in the show, if you haven't seen the show, who's like the head of Google, essentially. So he's like the creator of Google. And he's had a notoriously shit temper and he's notoriously horrible to everybody. And the joke was that he's going around being a total asshole to literally everyone that works for him and I'm doing his makeup and then I sort of chide him and bark at him for not being still and then he acts like a little puppy dog to the makeup artist and I realized like I needed to be the opposite of what I had done in the Longmire I needed to be intimidating. I needed to be a jerk. So I made a lot of choices so that I came across that way. I did a lot of that in my outfit. I decided instead of being like a chilled out looking makeup artist that I looked like a Mac makeup artist. And I went and got my makeup done at the Mac counter and I wore like clothes that looked sort of cool and a little bit intimidating. And then one of the jokes I needed a prop because you had to sort of use a makeup brush or something to sort of accentuate the joke. And again, I was told like, never use props, don't bring props into the room. I brought in a prop and the cast director, the first thing she said was like, oh, a prop, great, I love props. And I was like, okay, thank God. And then I used it, I accentuated the joke with a prop. It wasn't a big distraction. You know, I know that I can use props. You gotta check out. If you're a disaster with props, don't use props or, or work out how to get good with them. But I'm very comfortable with them and it helped sell the joke and I booked the job. And I had done all of that to tell the story that despite how mean this Gavin Belson character was, that he was gonna be intimidated by the makeup artist. So my job in telling the story was to intimidate this most intimidating person. And so I had to decide how I, Audrey, was gonna come across and intimidate the most intimidating person. And it was a risk because definitely when I walked into the room, all the other actresses were dressed like how every makeup artist I know on set is usually dressed, which is like pretty casual, pretty chill, not actually a lot of makeup on, looking very natural. But again, I knew that wasn't the story. Bringing in a prop to accentuate the joke, huge risk, huge risk. But I told the story, I could use a prop, I knew how to do it. It solved the joke, I booked the job. So those are my two stories about story and one time where I didn't pay attention or didn't know, was just literally unaware of the importance of it. And if I were to get that Longmire audition again, I would now know it is my job to be so angry that you think that myself or my husband may have killed that doctor. That's my job to tell that story. How I do that is my craft, but I have to tell the story, 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 story. And the person, no matter how good of an actor they are, that doesn't solve that for casting and the director is not gonna book that job. All right, I hope that helps. And now back to your regularly scheduled program. Okay, so I always end with my questions, as you know. So social media, do you want to plug yourself on anything? Sure. Instagram, I'm Jesse James Keitel, K-E-I-T-E-L. Twitter, I pretty much only post about Big Sky, but it's Jesse J. Keitel. Great. Okay, what is the best part of the business for you? The limitless potential for growth. I love that too. Uh, growth of the self, growth mm -hmm. of your career, growth of... Money. <sighs> Money, truly limitless possibilities. I was a seven episode minimum on Big Sky, ended up doing 16, going into season two. And I was a one year contract. So, you know, there's unexpected twists and turns, limitless potential for growth and opportunity. At every single turn, you never know what bizarre thing on your resume is going to circle back and change your life. It truly. I so agree. Yeah. What is the worst part about the business for you? It's easy to feel used and abused. Oh, uh, God, that's so real. And I think, I mean that in many ways. I think speaking from my own personal experience as a trans person on network television, it's easy to feel paraded. And it's hard because you and your image are used in promotion and stuff. And that's amazing. Like things that 
ultimately do enhance your celebrity. But it's it's easy to feel exploited for who you are. As an actor, you are exploited for who you are. Mm-hmm. Uh, ultimately, it's hard to separate character from self sometimes when you get into the financials of the industry. Do you feel like you're, you've gotten better or are working on boundary setting with your time and energy with regards to that? Absolutely. fucking lutely Get off Instagram. Don't doom scroll. Don't doom scroll. Limit your Twitter notifications. I think that's the strongest boundary you could set, truly. Uh, especially like if your show is coming out, if you're playing a mm-hmm. role that might get some people upset. It's easy to fall into this trap of, I want it, I want it, I want it. Like I see my friends get like millions of followers doing all this stuff. It's like, oh, I want that. But it's like, take time for yourself that isn't public. Also, this might be a small tangent. Get a hobby that you refuse to monetize. Because, yes. good God, I'm going to, I can't wait to get home. I'm going to get a pottery wheel and I'm going to start making vases and I'm not selling a single one. I'm going to give them away as gifts. Yes, you know, gift. like I started writing and monetized it. Like, like you know, I started mm-hmm. doing drag, monetized it, started doing this, monetized mm-hmm. it. You know, mm-hmm. fuck that. Do, do, do something for yourself that has nothing to do with your career. Mm. I love that. I love that you're going to get a pottery wheel. That makes sense. I can't wait. I've never done pottery before. (laughs) I can't wait. You're going to crush pottery. Okay. What do you wish somebody had taught you or managed to get you to understand when you were just a wee babe entering this business for the first time? It's not so serious. Oh, God. It's not the end of the world when you fuck up, because you will. We all do. You flubbing that line in that audition will not ruin your career. You having a bad day on set and not doing the performance you wanted is not going to ruin your career. You making a choice that is wrong and misinformed will not ruin your career. Like, you will be fine. And that it's truly, as cliche as it sounds, it is a marathon. It is not mm. a sprint. And even, sure, you're, you're hustling, you're hustling, you're pounding the pavement. You get there, you you book a job, you book another job, you book another job. Great. Take care of yourself. You got 40 more years. And I, I think about that and I see these actors I'm working with, John Carroll Lynch on the show, and his mm-hmm. career is monumental. I've actually been like binging his his work in, in this quarantine. And I look at it and I'm like, the stamina mm-hmm. that that must require to have that career. When you scroll on someone's IMDb and they have like 400 things listed, I almost can't fathom it. Doing a season of television, it's crushing. I rapped. Went home and sobbed. Sobbed. Uh, I ordered sushi, hopped in the tub, and ate <laughs> sushi in the bath, and like was just so emotionally and literally like me sobbing over like my like tuna <laughs> nigiri. I thought about that. Like I couldn't imagine doing this job for so long because it is so hard. And after taking a couple weeks off, I'm like, okay, great. Yeah, let's do it again. Come on. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is the thing that I try to explain to people about like the camaraderie and the compassion that happens once you've been in it for a second is that like that sense of like, you know, like you'll get jealous of people or whatever, because that's natural. But this sort of score taking and stuff that I think happens when you're on your way up, once you've been in it for a second, you know, somebody has a year where they don't work. Everyone's just like, yeah, man, don't worry. Like, you're great. Like, it's right around the corner for you. Like, you just sort of feel like, yeah, we're all in this. It feels like my brethren or my soul sisters. Like, it feels like... Um, like like we survived. Like like we made it. Yeah, yeah. it does. I don't fault people who leave the industry. Yeah. I was just going to say I, that. I, and then I like once it. you have that, you're like, my friends who've gotten that and then have been like, nah, I'm out. I do. I mean, one of my closest friends had a resume I would have killed for. And she quit, I think, by the time she was 30. And I remember being devastated that she quit because I felt like, well, if you quit, then like, what the fuck are we all doing? But I said to her, I said, you know, no one can say you didn't do it. No. Like you did it. And if you did it and you got there and you peeked behind the curtain and you did a little dance and you're like, nah, I think you know. And that's super valid. This is such a, a funny industry where you know, you can work consistently for years and years and years and then go a huge stretch of time without working or, or the opposite. You can go, you can not work for years and then mm. finally it's like your, your big break. But there are so many times I wish I could just sit back and bask in the calm. Mm-hmm. Like right now, I'm, I'm in quarantine for two weeks right now. I'm really enjoying it. Just being able to reset. 
taking time. It's okay to relax. It's okay to take a day off. It's okay to take a week off, take a month off, take care of yourself. Because I, after being away for almost a year of my life working, I am so excited to just go home and hug my dog, which I've mm-hmm. hugged my dog for a collective like two days over the last year. <laughs> so it's hard. And I think at one point in my life, especially when I was younger, I viewed the successes of my friends as an attack on myself. Yes. And it wasn't until I shifted that mindset where it's like, oh my God, so-and-so did that. I can do that. So-and-so did that. I'm going to do that. And then not only could I, I did and I would. And so are my other friends. And now it's like, oh, she's a series regular. He's a series regular. She's doing this. She got a BAFTA nomination. She got that. He got that. And it's like, how incredible, how incredible, like we're, keep at it. It's okay. And you know what? If you get burnt out and you leave the industry, which we all know plenty of people who have, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I think at one point in time, I also judged peers and friends who, who, who did do that. Cause I was mm-hmm. like, you couldn't make it. You, yeah, you yeah, like, yeah, uh, yeah, like yeah. But, couldn't hack it. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't, you couldn't make it sunny. Could you <laughs> like, 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 but you know, like, it's like, good, go, go live a life you love. And if this isn't yeah. it. Like, get the fuck out of here because this life is too short to be unhappy. And there are going to be many days of being an actor that you will be unhappy. And many, many beautiful, bright days that you won't be. But it's both. My wildest dreams came true. I was a series regular on on a hit show to a T what Mm -hmm. I was setting out for. Mm -hmm. And there are days where I just simply did not believe I could make it to the next. Mm -hmm. And have that support system. Keep yourself in check. Mm -hmm. Remember, it is not the end of the world if you have a bad day. People are going to like your work or they're going to say they don't. Mm -hmm. People are either going to love you or not. Whatever this experience of this day is, you're learning. It's a career in learning. It's a career in growth. We all are. That's what it is. Yeah. Even if you have this big, expansive, incredible three-generation long career, you're still learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. I have so many things I'm going to end with. But before we end, I want to have the final thing, which is mildly interesting. I'll start because I have a really exciting one for everyone. You guys, I have discovered the ranch seasoning packet and the power of the ranch seasoning packet. Because as you all know, I am a lighthouse ranch, huge advocate, and it has been sold out across Los Angeles grocery stores since the pandemic because word get out suddenly that the lighthouse ranch in the refrigerator vegetable section is the be all end all of the ranch dressing. And so I had to improvise. And so I Googled how to make ranch from scratch and found that if you did ranch seasoning packet with, you can do buttermilk, you can do milk, you can do cream and some sour cream. And you mix that shit together as a little heart attack added to your salad. And I have to say, I feel like a part of me is expanded to a place of satisfaction that I didn't know my little middle American heart could really grow to. And it's so great because I can take the ranch seasoning packets with me wherever I go. Listen, the ranch seasoning packets, not classy, but I do feel so trashy when I'm like, do you have ranch at the restaurant? Because often in New York and LA and the metropolitan areas, they're like too cool for ranch at the restaurant. And I'm like, hi, I need I need, I, I need that ranch. <laughs> I am going to need some ranch. Like, I don't know what this food is going to be without it. But now I can just like keep a ranch seasoning packet in my purse like, I don't know, a trashy bitch, I guess, and then just spread it on whatever I need it to be spreaded on. And it's so satisfying. And we even talked about, my husband and I talked about like, you know what we could do is get the Lighthouse Ranch and add ranch seasoning packet <laughs> to the Lighthouse Ranch and just see what possibilities unfold. Okay, what do you got? So I recently moved out of New York City. Uh, For the first time in my uh, life, I am living in the suburbs in the Hudson Valley, the newest resident. And I am so into fixer-upper Instagram pages. (gasps) I adore them so much. My family comes from like a construction and real estate background. So I've always just dreamed of like redoing a house or like redoing Projects. projects, projects, projects. And here is where my life has changed. And I don't know if this is an effect of the pandemic and I'm just another basic bitch, but I never wear color. I've never gravitated towards color. I've always been like black, white, maybe the occasional red. Yeah. I want to paint my entire home like top to bottom colors right now. I love this. 
You're speaking my super language. But it's funny. Historically, I don't like colors. So I'm very excited to paint my living room a dark blue on the walls, the molding, and the ceiling. You listening might think I'm crazy, and it's going to look really good. I believe in you. I'm into full room monochromatic experiences right now. (laughs) Well, listen, what I so love about this conversation, and what I'm really so grateful to you about this conversation with is truly your candor, your transparency, because, you know, I'm all about transparency on this podcast, just of what the working actor life is like. Because especially with my friends who are serious regulars, it feels like this dirty little secret hidden club thing where, you know, my friends who are working on like shows like, you know, 22, 24 episodes and they come home and I talk to them and I'm like, how are you? Like, are you okay? Do you need like, I treat them like, do you need a blanket? You want some soup? It's real though. I've got a stepped animal. And then the feedback from my friends is always like, you know, thank you so much. Like, there's not a lot of people that I feel like I can talk to about that with because there's this feeling of like, well, you're like one of the chosen ones. So you can't like ever express feeling feelings, really, because like all you can ever express is like the so things are just like here. magical. Oh, my gosh. All and it's, the time. And it's hard because it. it's, it's like it feels like champagne problems because, I mean, it's like you're getting paid a lot of money. You're living your dream job. You're doing doing all this stuff you got press you got this you got that the sharp sparkle the sheen but it's like yeah but at what cost that it's also work it's work it is work and even yeah. when you're not working when you're not on set listen there have been episodes where i don't have a lot to do and it's like mm-hmm. a pretty light load for me mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. i'm the first to film on one episode and the last to film on the next one girl mm-hmm. you got two mm-hmm. to three weeks that you're waiting mm-hmm. to work and you're in another mm-hmm. country you have no friends or family and yeah. covid So what do you do? Who are you in that off time? And even not a pandemic, you guys, I just want you to know, like, each step of the way is going to hit you with new challenges, new opportunities, but things that you, like, didn't expect. And so I'm so passionate about, on each level, having an honest conversation about what this is and what this really looks like so that people can walk forward with like a little truth and understanding about what they're walking into. And we are all in this together. And having a shared understanding and camaraderie and compassion and support and cheerleading for each process along the way. Well, thank you. And thank you for having me because you know what? I think I found a lot of that camaraderie from being a listener. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you for not only for having me, but for having the podcast. No, of course. All right, you guys, this has been a magical season. I think I'm gonna go have a shot of tequila because I'm so proud of all of us. If it wasn't a pandemic, I'd have a live hangout where we could all, you know, get together and chill and like celebrate this year. But it's a pandemic and I'm gonna just stay safe. And I hope you do too. And I hope you get vaccinated. I got vaccinated. I'm just like so ready for herd immunity. I can't even stand how much I'm ready for herd immunity. And thank you so much for a beautiful season. I am so proud of everyone. And I'm so grateful for this community that has grown. The influence I see everybody having over the whole of the industry of taking your time to put your career first and taking the time to understand story and taking the time to fight for representation and inclusion and to have camaraderie and compassion and passion for yourselves and for each other. I'm so blown away by everybody. So thank you so much for a beautiful season and I will see you on the next round. I've got some really incredible things planned. Thanks so much to Jesse James Keitel. I love you, girl. I like love you, love you. I can't wait to see you soon. I think we're going to be in the same town soon. So I'm like super excited and we will chill and we'll have margaritas and it's going to be magical and fabulous. All right. I adore you. And thank you so much for coming on and sharing and being so wonderful. Special thanks this week and every week to Thomas Hank Snodgrass for his incredible work with sound. Thanks, Tommy. You guys, Thomas loves to surf. So if you ever see him out there, just give him a little hang something sign with you do with your hands. 
Executive producer, Jesse Lumen, my still so handsome husband, getting more handsome every year, I should say. Show music by Ari De Niro, theme song by Alok Mehta and 108 Hill, and editing by Taylor Martirana. Taylor! <laughs> <laughs> Crushing it. All right, most importantly, don't forget your towel.